Hi, this is API Days Helsinki, and we have here Andrew McCauley from Shopify. And you had something to tell us about how remote feeling feels for you in Shopify or you personally. Did you have something yeah. in mind? Yeah. So at Shopify, we actually have a number of teams that, that have been working remotely already. Um, I work remotely a day or two a week. Mm -hmm. So the transition wasn't so hard for me. Um, but I will say that I'm becoming a much better cook being at home all the time. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I'm a gamer myself, so it's, it's not outside of, of the, the realm of reality for, for me before. COVID. Yeah, so you're just enjoying that. You can kind of have life, the gaming yeah. screen on the other <laughs> screen and, and, and work <laughs> on the other. No, no, funny. No, uh, no, but hey, no. only productivity. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And anyway, Shopify has probably been one of those companies that has actually like benefited from all of this remote stuff happening. So, yeah. hey, um, but you are going to kind of talk about version two or, or not version or how to version your APIs yeah. at least. So just lead us to the path. Thank you. Take it away. Perfect. Yeah. As, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Andrew McCauley. I'm the lead of the developer success management team at Shopify. And I'm, I'm just going to walk you through the story of how Shopify uh, ended up with a versioned API. Uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to learn from our experience whether you're building a versioned API or you're transitioning to it or, or you already have and support one. First, I, I want to take a moment to just tell a bit about myself. Uh, I was born in the Northwest Territories of Canada, uh, but I moved to Ottawa, which is the nation's capital, uh, when I was four. And I've called it home ever since. I'm engaged to my beautiful fiance, Terry. We were actually supposed to get married fairly recently. So thanks a lot, coronavirus. Uh, we had to postpone that. Uh, I have three cats, and as I mentioned, I'm a gamer. I started at Shopify back in 2013 as actually a support guru, uh, when the company was about 120th the size that it is now. I learned a ton in those early days, uh, specifically about the internet, software as a service, and e-commerce. And eventually I sought new, more challenging work at Shopify, and found myself moving to the escalated support team, uh, where I continued learning. Specifically, I learned about Shopify's APIs, about web development, and how Shopify worked under the hood. After about two years working at Shopify, I found my way onto the app platform team, uh, which we now call the ecosystem team, uh, where I worked with partners building apps for Shopify merchants. I quickly became a subject matter expert on Shopify's developer APIs, our SDKs, and our extension points. And four years later, I still work uh, with Shopify's app partners, but now with a focus on uh, those apps that are installed on the most merchant shops, as well as those on the largest and most successful shops. But enough about me. Let me take a minute to talk about Shopify uh, for those who aren't familiar. Uh, I'm gonna talk about its app platform and kind of the scale that we were able to reach, uh, which will be important a bit later. So Shopify is one of the biggest global e-commerce platforms. We serve merchants around the globe across different markets, categories, and types, ranging from aspirational merchants uh, like mom and pop shops to establish global brands with audiences in the millions. Our goal at Shopify is to make commerce better for truly everyone. And we're well on our way to this goal with over 1 million merchants using Shopify across 175 countries these merchants account for uh, or have accounted for 183 billion US dollars in global economic activity. And we didn't start our journey this big, of course. We got here in no small part due to our partner ecosystem. Specifically, I wanna talk about the 3,700 plus apps that are listed in the Shopify app store. We've always built our platform with features that most merchants need most of the time. Our ecosystem of partner built apps fulfill the merchant needs Shopify's product does not. And it even, they even expand upon the needs that our product does fulfill. So now that you know a bit about me, a bit about Shopify and our app platform, I wanna take a look at the first leg of Shopify's journey to a versioned API. And for that, 
we'll need to rewind to 2017. Back in the year of Wonder Woman, Me Too, and when there was still hope for the Game of Thrones finale, Shopify started work on a massive refactor to an area that was largely untouched since the platform launched in the late 2000s. <clears throat> that area was inventory. We needed a way for merchants to identify multiple locations where inventory could be held, as well as add and track inventory at each of these locations. We called this change to the surprise of no one, multi-location inventory, or MLI internally. This was one of, if not the most requested feature from merchants. We knew we needed to build it, but we also recognized that it was a massive undertaking. So let me break down the change that needed to happen. But first, I wanna define what I mean by product and product variant. So with this example of a t-shirt, the product would be the t-shirt and the product variants would be each of the size and color combinations below. Essentially, a product has many product variants. So before multi-location inventory, a product variants inventory was stored on the variant itself in the inventory quantity field. You could make a get request to the associated product or to the variant itself to fetch the inventory. To update the inventory, you would simply update the product variant with the inventory number you want. And that was it. In order to support inventory at multiple locations, we had to build a few APIs. So we built a locations API, allowing the ability to fetch the physical locations where a merchant holds inventory, an inventory item API, which represents the physical good available to be shipped to a customer. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a product variant and an inventory item. And lastly, we built an inventory level API, which represents the available quantity of an inventory item at a certain location. So each inventory level belongs to one inventory item and has one location. And for every location where an inventory item is available, there's going to be an inventory level that represents the inventory items quantity at that location. So in order to interact with the product's inventory, you now needed to use three distinct APIs instead of one previously. And here's what that relationship looks uh, mapped out. A product variant has an inventory item, which has many inventory levels, one for each location. And you can see that multiple different products and their inventory items and associated inventory levels can share a location. Right, when you think about having a warehouse, that warehouse has multiple items in it. Unfortunately, a refactor like this does not guarantee a field of dreams like transition for developers. There is no utterance of if you build it, they will come. We still needed the ecosystem of apps to migrate to this new inventory paradigm. And this is easier said than done due to the fact that many developers live by the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it adage. So how do you ship a breaking change to your API? From my experiences, it takes a high level of communication with your developer community, as well as a strong API versioning program. It took the experience of such a difficult problem as multi-location inventory for us at Shopify to reach this conclusion. You see, Shopify's success is largely due to this flywheel. A flywheel essentially just being a model for systems thinking that essentially acts as a reinforcing loop. Bolster any portion of the loop and the other parts of the loop also get bolstered. So here, the more merchants using Shopify, the more GMV they generate. And for those unaware, GMV stands for gross merchandise volume and is the total value of products sold by our merchants. The more GMV Shopify merchants generate, the bigger the opportunity for partners to build and launch successful apps to our app store. More partners making more apps means more merchants' needs being met, helping bring in more merchants to the platform. So in this flywheel, if one party succeeds, whether it's merchants, partners, or Shopify, 
all other parties succeed. But that also means the inverse. If we ship a change that causes apps to break, it means merchants will lose out on key functionality they require in order to operate, which means Shopify will lose out on GMV from our merchants, which will reduce the partner opportunity, et cetera. Or put more simply, merchants' ability to make money is hampered when they have broken apps installed. For this migration to be successful, we needed all three parts of this flywheel to remain strong. So where other platforms might set a migration deadline and YOLO ship it on that deadline, leaving developers who did not migrate their apps in time scrambling to fix their broken apps, the risk to merchants and thus Shopify was too great. In order to ensure we could make the change and that all developers could have the migration work required to support the change finished in time, we tried two things. First, we began communicating to partners who needed to update their apps. We created migration guides, sent email marketing, hosted webinars, recorded videos, and spent massive amounts of support hours working with these developers to galvanize them to action and support the technical debt that we were imposing upon them. We set a deadline for July 1st, which is when we were going to stop supporting the old method of interacting with inventory. To put this into perspective, Shopify had a team of four people providing developer support to partners at the time, myself included. During the period between March 1st and July 1st, 2018, those four people supported over 450 uh, partner developers in their migration to multi-locations alone. That doesn't include support on any of our other APIs, SDKs, or extensions. Our partners were not alone in the pain that they felt through this migration, as we felt it too. So once July 1st hit, and we saw nowhere near our goal for the number of apps uh, that we wanted migrated, we decided to decouple the merchant feature launch from the API launch and postpone the deadline for apps. We created an opt-in flow for merchants to make their stores multi-location enabled. This allowed us to automatically opt in any net new merchant stores, as well as any shops without any affected apps installed. We also displayed a warning to any merchants that were opted in when they attempted to install a new app that had not been updated to support multi-location inventory. A shop that was opted in could create new locations, assign inventory to those lo locations, and manage their inventory across multiple locations. A shop that did not opt in would continue working under the old paradigm where inventory quantity on the product variant was all they had. Any app installed on a shop supporting multiple locations would need to use the new APIs to interact with inventory. Now, technically we didn't fully remove the old pattern on shops with multi-location in inventory enabled, but we did make a default behavior where interacting with the inventory quantity on the product variant directly would be the same as interacting with the inventory at the merchant's default location. This created two distinct code paths that needed to be maintained and caused a ton of confusion for our developers. In order to prevent any shops with apps from breaking when opting into multi-location, we also gave a warning to merchants as well as a confirmation modal that they needed to click before the change could be made. Merchants started feeling the confusion now too. And just to give you an idea of, of this timeline, we first launched the inventory API in February, 2018 and ended up having such a convoluted and inconsistent approach to the migration work that we are just now coming to the July 1st, 2020 date where the legacy inventory behavior will finally be fully unsupported. We ended up pushing this migration deadline back a staggering five times. So at Shopify, rather than think of trust as a Boolean, uh, we think of it as a gradient with many points between each end. We use the metaphor of trust being a battery. And I can tell you throughout the multi-location work we did, we 
definitely drained our partner's trust batteries. We started having conversations around whether we should move to a versioned API, as we knew we needed to charge our partner's trust batteries again. We realized a good platform should have a healthy balance between platform stability and release predictability and shipping changes and process, progressing the capabilities of our platform. Really, we needed a better, <clears throat> more transparent way of breaking our API in the name of platform progress. And for those familiar with the idea of an API contract, which is the expectation that the documented behavior will continue being upheld, we essentially needed a way to predictably break that contract without breaking merchant stores. So on April 9th, 2019, over one year since work began on multi-locations, we introduced our very first version. Welcome to the world, newborn 2019-04. This was our very first version and didn't actually contain any changes. Instead, it was a snapshot of our API at the time we released it. It laid the groundwork for future versions, however. So let me give you an overview of Shopify's versioning strategy, which consisted of bundling all API changes with the exception of critical bug fixes into quarterly releases on the 1st of January, April, July, and October. As you've seen, each version is named after the year and month that it was released. The version is specified directly in the endpoint URL. A version is supported for, by Shopify for 12 months before being unsupported and removed, which means developers have nine months to migrate when a breaking change is introduced. And for context, we define a breaking change as anything that would cause a developer to do work to preserve the correct and current functionality of their app. And for those that are a bit more visual learners, here's what that timeline looks like. The orange bar is our stable version, which you can see is supported for 12 months before becoming unsupported, which is the gray bar. If the next version introduces a breaking change, it means once the current version becomes unsupported, all apps must have adopted that breaking change. And that's the nine month migration window that I mentioned previously. We also have the purple bar, which represents what we call the unstable version. This acts as a sort of staging version where we deploy changes we want developers to use for early testing or that we're testing ourselves internally. It's not recommended for production apps as it's always changing. And lastly, the turquoise bar is the release candidate version or RC. It's a preview of the upcoming version where we ship upcoming changes that are already considered finished. For example, Today, you can target the 2020-07 version, even though it isn't July yet, and get access to any stable changes that we've already shipped to the release candidate. So the versioning strategy we released allows us to be predictable with how we release API changes. Developers building apps for Shopify merchants now have a reliable timeline of maintenance that they can follow for their apps but that's not enough for us to ensure we have 100% of apps migrated to the newest version before older ones are unsupported. Versioning alone doesn't give us the confidence that merchants will be unaffected once an API version is unsupported and removed. You also need to have a strong bi-directional line of communication with your developer community. And I can't stress this point enough. You need to hear in order to be heard. Increasing the transparency in our API roadmap was our way of communicating to partners the things that they should be aware of, but we also needed to listen to our partners in order to succeed at changing our platform. So here are some of the initiatives that we took to bolster our communication channels. First, we started involving partners more in early development of new APIs or even changes to existing APIs. By starting to allow partners to have more input into the changes we were going to make, we increased our buy-in from them when we shipped those changes.
We also launched developer preview stores, which allow developers to test merchant features before they are launched to merchants themselves. These allow developers to give early feedback on upcoming merchant features and how they might affect existing functionality with their apps. It also allows us to more easily decouple merchant feature launches and API launches, allowing for smoother releases in the future. We also launched a new API health dashboard designed to give developers near real-time insights into any deprecated API calls their apps are making. We base this page on actual logging for each app and provide links to documentation, display the date of the deprecated call, uh, the last detected deprecated call, and the date any migration needs to be done by. This dashboard has had a huge impact on getting our developer community on board with our versioning strategy and allows us to more easily express the changes that need to be made in any communications that we make to partners about upcoming deprecations. And here's an example of how the API Health dashboard was received by partners. This is an actual quote from a partner who says, actually shout out to all those who made the API Health dashboard it's a lifesaver and adds a huge deal to our Shopify app developer happiness. It's like watching all your tests go green, but a thousand times more satisfactory because it's an external authority validation, which was great feedback to hear. We've got a ton of it like this. And when it came to introducing breaking changes, we started having a more hands-on approach with partners. Uh, specifically those partners who operate our most successful and widest used apps. These are the apps installed on the most successful shops with the highest merchandise volume. So we need to be particularly careful we don't cause those shops to break. We started communicating to these partners much earlier about breaking changes that affect their app. Through constant communication, we began working closer with these partners to understand their roadmap and where the version migration work fit in it. Instead of sending a barrage of reminders to update, we started fostering a more close relationship with these partners, which allowed each party to increase the transparency into each other's plans. This, so far, has led to more commitment from our largest partners when it comes to making the necessary changes to stay on the cutting edge of the Shopify platform. And it's also reduced the worry we have internally of apps breaking. <clears throat> so these initiatives have helped us build stronger relationships and communication channels with our partner community, not only when it comes to our versioning efforts, but also in a broader sense. We would never be able to have the success that we've had towards our goal of making commerce better for everyone without our community of developers. So whatever your goal or your company's goal is, don't forget that your developer community can help you get there. You just need to remember to hear them so you can be heard by them. Thanks. Awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you. And as a Shopify customer, we actually run a Shopify store at my company, Osana. So it's really great to hear that how, how everything works. But um, I have a question because it's really kind of time and effort and resource consuming sometimes to run a lot of API versions in production yeah. uh, at the same time. So how did you come up with this strategy and, and the time frame of 12 months? So, Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And really it all came down to our experience with uh, the rollout of multiple locations. Mm -hmm. um, it took about 18 months um, for that effort. And that was kind of the first time we tried to release a change uh, as, as big as, as, as it was. Yeah. Um, so using that as a reference, we kind of decided that 12 months with a more concerted effort would likely be enough, enough time um, for, for developers to update their apps. Um, but we also started investing in, in other teams, uh, like my team, uh, to work with partners to help them uh, support the technical debt that we're imposing upon them. Yeah, I think that it's really important that you have taken those key customers or key partners already yeah. on board because in my experience with, with a system that involves uh, kind of money legal stuff and, and a lot of uh, 
kind of organizations and parties and partners in it. So it just takes a few years typically yeah. to, to achieve that. So it's, it's really amazing that you did it in 12 months now. And, and also I think that those tools that you have chosen to build, like it's basically a concierge uh, strategy for, <laughs> for helping your partners to version. And I think that that is going to be very, very good. Thing overall yep. for you. And, and it doesn't stop there. We're, we're continuing to come up with new tools that we can give to developers to make the experience yeah. easier. And we're essentially trying to share our roadmap in hopes that partners will share their roadmap with us so that we can mm -hmm. just be aligned on, on what yes. each other is working on. Um, and actually, we uh, for the recent uh, version, um, Sunsetting, we we're able to ask our partner community um, what they thought about the work required for it, given this new normal that we're living in with, with COVID-19. Um, and it was super well appreciated by, by the partners, kind of having that level of empathy. So we're kind of figuring it out as we go still, um, still early days, but it's an evolving process for sure. And it requires a lot of openness from everybody, but I, it's really, looking like it's paying off for you so hey thank you a lot for this talk it was very good and very uh kind of insightful so i hope that our viewers will enjoy it too thank you andrew yeah me too thanks for having me